A few years ago, some geophys was done over some crop marks in that field up there, and it produced some of the most tantalising results that we've seen for years. Not only that, but a metal detectorist has found a tiny bit of Bronze Age gold up there, and lots of pottery has come up, including this 5th century piece. But this is Cornwall, this is Turkish, and this tiny little bit, believe it or not, is African. So what on earth's going on here? Well, evidence has been found suggesting ancient mariners plied these waters thousands of years ago, bringing in from overseas exotic goods such as wine, silk and papyrus, and taking away local tin and copper. So is there the remotest chance that this is the shadow of an early trading site, the like of which we've never seen on Time Team before? As usual, we've got just three days to find out. The Atlantic coast in Cornwall is a spectacular and perilous place for a sailor, notoriously difficult to navigate and littered with treacherous rocks. But in amongst the dangers are sheltered havens like this, the mouth of the River Camel, a huge tidal inlet that joins the ancient fishing port of Padstow to the sea. And just a couple of hundred metres from the turbulent Atlantic is Lilizic overlooking a beautiful sandy cove. This is so nice, it just reminds me of holidays as a kid, up yeah. on a headland watching the boats coming in and out. And they've probably been coming in and out of an estuary like this for thousands of years because this is an ideal place to live, just above the beach, south facing, you know, settlement in this field here. Steve, spectacular geophys. Just amazing geophys, Tony. And um, we first became aware of this site as a result of uh, metal detecting activity and the range of, uh, of Bronze Age and, and Roman material. A few years later, I did a, a flight over the area looking for crop marks, and one of the sites that we recorded was this field, and we found a lot of circular features, ring ditches oh. at the top of the field. John, do you think these are houses? I'm sure some of them must be. I mean, look at the detail. You can actually see what appears to be a central hearth within that particular structure. I'm sure we're seeing lots of houses across the field. But they didn't get a town planner in, did they? No, but you wouldn't expect that at that date. If this is late prehistoric, you know, they, they didn't build things on grids and layouts then. It's much more random and haphazard how they're doing it. We not only need to find out why this is this shape, yeah. and how old it is, yeah. but what it was doing here at all, what its well, function Well, that's right, and is it something to do with a trading port or something like that in the estuary? So, with the old geophys as our guide, we're going to start our investigation by opening two trenches, one in each of the fields that overlooks the beach. In the lower field nearest the cove, Matt and Rakshar are putting a trench in over a large geophys anomaly, which doesn't much look like the traditional roundhouses in the other field. Could it be because the archaeology here, as Mick suspects, was linked to ancient trade? Whereas over in the upper field, Phil's investigating what could be an Iron Age roundhouse that wouldn't normally be associated with the types of finds previously discovered on this site. Finds that include pieces of Bronze Age axe, Roman coins, and of course, the intriguing exotic 5th and 6th century pottery from overseas. In fact, we could be looking at a thousand years of activity. But unfortunately, most of this material has been found lying about on the ground, and that means the archaeologists can't use it to date anything here. So until we uncover our own finds buried safely in our own archaeology, we can only make an educated guess at the date of the settlement. 
Well, I think they could be Bronze Age houses. I mean, they're sort of 8 to 12 metres diameter. That's spot on for Bronze Age. And then I suspect they probably continue into the Iron Age. But don't forget, down here, we're not in a particularly Romanised part of the country. We shouldn't assume that in the Roman period they go on to rectangular buildings, villas, that sort of thing. There's very little of that in Cornwall. There's no reason why this can't go on into the Roman period or even into the post-Roman period and still be using roundhouses. It could be a very long period. One thing that fascinates me about this geophys is that they seem to have really thick walls around these houses. What I think you've got is an outer stone face, a core of rubbish, midden material, and then another inner stone core. So it's a composite wall. Does cavity rubbish insulation make any sense to you, Francis? Well, sort of sense, Tony, yeah. Um, I think the main thing is you've got structure. You may have finds actually on the floor in the central hards, but mm. what that geophys tells me is that those houses are very undisturbed. Well, we've dug prehistoric roundhouses before on Time Team, and circles like this do suggest the remains of a mud or stone house roofed with thatch or turf. It might also be surrounded by a ditch to drain away the rainwater, while inside there's normally a hearth for the family fire. But although archaeologically they're fairly easy to uncover, it's much more difficult to date a prehistoric house. What you need are finds. Well, it's very corroded. The edges are all really rough. This looks suspiciously like a coin. Normally, the perfect start for a time team dig. Except there weren't coins like this around in the Iron Age. Ah. Oh! And within minutes, Matt's trench produces another surprise. Slag. We did actually find some of this in the topsoil, and it was quite a big, hefty piece. Yeah, it's from the top of that silt underneath all this subsoil stuff. Pieces of slag imply evidence of industrial activity, but as yet, we have no date. Carl, have a look at this. This is the first find of any significance that's come out of that trench. It's pretty manky. I don't know if you'll be able to date it at all. From its shape, it's obviously... Um, a coin, and it's a Roman yeah, coin. Yeah, I, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a coin. This is a, a Roman coin, which is nice to see because several others have been found in the field by the metal detectorists. Why do you say that's Roman? Um, from its shape, it's it's been hammered in, by using a hand hammer, and also I can probably go even a bit further go on. and say that it's most likely from the Emperor Hadrian, who was around about the 2nd century AD. And it's Hadrian because... From the shape of the actual head, the commonest coin which has that sort of shape on it is of Hadrian. So confident and in front of a television camera. That's experience. Look at that. How many of you could tell that that was a coin of the Emperor Hadrian? So our first piece of dating material puts Matt's trench firmly into the Roman period, possibly centuries after our potential prehistoric settlement in the other field. That is, if we can find it, because at the moment, all we've got in Phil's trench are a series of strange stone features, which Phil is convinced are natural. Bridge, however, is more optimistic and believes they could be remains of a structure. John is simply bemused and confused. Well, I mean, you've definitely got a good edge mm. swinging round there. Back in the lower field, Matt's on a roll. Um, pottery, prehistoric. It's Cornish, what we call native courseware. I wouldn't like to say whether it was Iron Age or, or Roman, because it doesn't change a great deal, but it's, it's that kind of period, so... And that's just out of, that's, that's that's just out of the edge here, where, the, where this natural's cut away into this silt stuff, isn't it? So stratified among this, this material, it's, uh, it's good dating evidence. Yeah, so, um, so yeah I think, uh, here's the second one. Yeah. That's a rim, there you go. Yeah, it looks like the base of a straight-sided jar. Again, native courseware, and, and look at the state of the pot, it's obviously been used for cooking. Yeah, really burnt. Isn't so it? That's great. More intriguing finds, but no evidence yet that Matt's archaeology has got anything to do with Phil's possible settlement. And in spite of Matt's finds, I'm also starting to worry about Mick's hunch that this was an ancient trading site. Even if at first glance, it seems to be in the ideal position. 
this water is far too shallow to navigate even at high tide. And that's not all. Stuart believes these cliffs are much the same as 2,000 years ago, and anyone can see that it would have been very tricky mooring ships alongside. So did the exotic overseas pottery really come here by boat? Stuart's job over the next three days is to find out what links this quiet cove to the civilizations of North Africa and the Middle East. On top of the cliffs, the search for the Iron Age village continues. Phil's still trying to locate a roundhouse, and he's now extended the trench to see if these rock features are indeed part of a structure. That makes a lot of sense, widening and lengthen that a bit, doesn't it, to get it clearer? Yeah, at the moment we can't actually see the curving arc of the ditch. But, if so it's wide... but although we may be lacking firm evidence of a roundhouse, John's convinced he's found the edge of the village. Yeah, I mean, it looks as though we've reached the limit in this direction, at any rate, uh, of the ring ditches. Right. And it's just possible there's a sort of boundary that's coincidental. Yeah, that's what really interests me, John, that boundary ditch, because it then continues further on. But if the boundary ditch is contemporary with those houses, then I think that gives us a much better chance of dating the houses than the stuff you'll find inside them. My thought was to put a trench that looks at the interior again, a second right. look, yep. goes from that possible hearth feature across the ring ditch and also over the boundary, mm -hmm. so along that line. So Francis is opening a new trench in the upper field to see if we can locate another roundhouse and to see if that structure is built up against the boundary ditch. It should also increase our chances of finding some dating evidence. In the lower field, Matt's trench is starting to look like a house. Or so he tells me. And the finds are tantalising. This is another one of these imported exotics. I don't recognise the specific type, although I do recognise that we've had identical material from Tintagel, which is the known type site here in Cornwall, which is only a few miles up the coast. So where do you think it's imported from? It's most likely have come from Turkey in the 5th or 6th centuries. Right, that's post-Roman? Post yes, yes. This is fantastic, our first link to the Mediterranean. And just as importantly, it looks as if this structure was used by local people from the early Roman period until 200 years after the Romans had left Britain. And that means, at the minute, there's little to link it to the prehistoric puzzles in the other field, where, in spite of the geophys, Phil's been struggling all day to find anything that looks remotely like an Iron Age roundhouse. Any sign of a hearth? No, not yet, not yet, but I, I mean... Granted, he's found ditches that could have been cut away for drainage, but he still hasn't got any finds. In fact, the most Iron Age roundhouse-ish type structure on site seems to be in Matt's much later Roman and Beyond trench. The geophysics showed this huge ring in this field here, and this is the ring here, it's this ditch. Oh, so that is actually that. Yeah, it goes all the way around like that. So now I'm walking into the house and you can see that the soil is kind of going this dark grey colour, especially round here. That's because there's so much charcoal in here. And we found some burnt animal bone up there as well, so I mean, there's, there's just their rubbish all over the floor, really. Is this the wall on the other side? Ah, now, according to the geophysics, the ditch there, the wall ditch, should go round behind you and should be at the other end of the trench there. So this should be about the centre of the house. So is this the hearth that's producing all the charcoal and, and burnt material? Yeah, it looks like it. Right. You've got finds in the finds tray? Yep, we've some great stuff out of here. Are so there's another bit down there? Yep, yep, there's another bit in situ down there, you can see. That's a bit of amphora. So these are these big wine or oil storage jars. And this is coming from the East Mediterranean then? Yep, that's post-Roman as well, that's 5th wow. or 6th century. <laughs> So if this isn't my outside wall, where is the other outside wall? Well, according to the geophysics, it should be right about the other end of the trench there. Right here somewhere? Yep. Rakshar, can you stand up for a sec? And the other wall is where Rakshar is. Mm -hmm. If that's right, it's a heck of a big building, mate. It's a huge building, especially if it's producing material like this, this post-Roman stuff. That's really exciting. Why would it be so significant if it was that sort of date? Because we don't get structures that are sort of post-Roman 
very often, particularly with the fines associated with them. And this is the so-called Dark Ages because we don't know very much about yeah, it. Usually because we can't tell her of that period because we haven't got the fines to go with them. So if this is 5th or 6th century, then this could actually be illuminating the Dark Ages, which isn't a bad job for tomorrow, is it? Day two in our investigation of an ancient settlement in Cornwall that we think may have been involved with sea trading. We've had some striking, possibly trade-related finds in Matt's Trench, but so far, nothing to really prove this place was a port. And in spite of Phil's best efforts and Francis digging a new trench, we just can't seem to find the village promised by the cracking geophys in the upper field. Yesterday evening we got really excited about the trench on the far side of that hedge because we think we may have a very rare 5th or 6th century AD roundhouse. Over here we're about a thousand years earlier, so Francis, should I be as excited about this trench? Of course you should, Tony. We've got what looks like it's the remains of an Iron Age floor in situ, and then right in the middle of them here you've got this burnt earth and that, I think, is the central hearth. Yeah. And then just to one side of it, we got that, that oh, piece oh. of pottery. That's good quality stuff, isn't it? Yeah, I yeah. think that's probably 2nd century BC, something like that, mm. later Iron Age. But over here, we've got the ditch that went round the outside of the house, so the wall would have been about here. And then over here, it gets better, we've got another ditch and that's the ditch that went outside the house, but then around all the houses in the settlement. So this is the enclosure ditch around the outside. So when we get the relationship of this ditch to that ditch to the house, we've actually potentially got the phasing of the settlement. Mick, what's the significance about the fact that we've got an Iron Age hut here hundreds of years before the Romans arrived, and over the other side of the hedge we've got a post-Roman hut? Well, in a way, this is what we expected to find. When we saw all those crop marks and that geophysical, I think we all said yeah. late prehistoric Bronze Age or Iron Age. So this, you know, is really what we expected it to be. We didn't expect to get anything like that. But, of course, that might turn out to have Iron Age stuff underneath it, and this might still produce some post-Roman stuff. So it's probably all part of the same settlement. Although Mick sounds confident, the fact is the dating evidence so far suggests there's a gap of at least a couple of hundred years between the archaeology in the two fields. So we could be looking at an entirely different settlement here in the lower field. But it's a good one. Matt and Rakshar have already found evidence of industry, trade and, most intriguingly, what could be a rare post-Roman roundhouse but to be sure, they need to find an entrance. Two potential ones are here, aren't they? Yeah. Or possibly there. Yeah, 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 that looks quite good, actually, isn't it? If we go there, we'll get a lot. The star find in Matt's trench yesterday was this small piece of Turkish pottery that had somehow travelled hundreds, even thousands of miles from the Mediterranean ports to Cornwall in the 5th or 6th century. And it's this evidence, along with the pieces of African pot that have already been found, that lead archaeologists to believe our cove could once have been visited by ships from all over southern Europe. The problem for me is it seems an odd place to put a harbour. Talk to local fishermen who've plied these waters all their lives and they'll tell you that this quiet stretch of the Cornish coast is deceptively dangerous. You've got a big swell coming in that turns the boats over. They get there and they get smashed up. Is there a way through that local people will know, or do you just have to leave it alone? Only on the high water. Yeah. The local boats will go in any time after about three hours, three hours or four hours flood. And then they can go in and they take their time. They come across the bar and go across then. It would have been incredibly difficult a couple of thousand years ago, wouldn't it, if you were coming in from Turkey or Africa somewhere and you you found this. That was where the sailing ships went aground, you see, because they would come up channel with like a, a southwest breeze, gale of wind, we'll say. And as soon as they got in here, the southwest wind had come in out the river at them. And that's how they all foundered on the shore over there. They wouldn't know what it is, would they? And a quick look at the modern navigation map would seem to confirm that this is not an ideal place for a port. This is the, the modern map, and our site is just in there. 
and you can see immediately how, how sheltered it is round the back of this headland here. You've got the full force of the Atlantic coming up here, but if you come around here, it, it's perfectly sheltered. This green area is all sands, and that, which you wouldn't really want to, to, to bring a no. boat over. And the main channel of the Camel is out in the middle now, going off down the estuary, down up towards Padstow. But now that Stuart's got his hands on the earliest admiralty charts for the cove, he's beginning to think that a harbour here wouldn't be total madness, thanks to the constantly shifting sands. The area in the middle of the channel is completely blocked off with these sandbanks mm. up here. The modern channel cuts right through that it does. sandbank there, and this is called... Oh, crikey, doom. it's called the Doom Bar. I, I think that probably <laughs> tells you what, what it's spelt for the navigators there. If we go back a little oh, bit that's further, nice. that. this is 1634, a little bit more okay. stylized, but yeah. our site is in this area here. And it's showing the, the sea coming up in, into the bay, Harbour Cove. Oh, and a little boat yes. drawn on, look. And I think that might be the cartographer's way of saying, here, here be harbour sort yeah. of thing. So yeah. there seems to be a lot of evidence going back to the 17th century that there is the possibility that water comes right up into this bay and it could function as, as a harbour. So I think these charts and the whole story of the navigation around this could help us work out whether this was actually a trading centre would have functioned as, as a, a major yeah. port, yeah. actually. So with a renewed confidence in our potential port, geophys go back into the lower field to look for any signs of occupation or activity in between our Dark Age house and the beach. While Matt is continuing to search for the other side of this massive round building and hopefully a doorway. Down on the beach, Stuart's about to test his theory that there was once enough deep water here to allow ships to reach an ancient harbour. Yeah, I just love the high-tech approach of getting a large lump of metal and shoving it in the ground. <laughs> oh, sand. <laughs> if they can tell how deep the channel was in ancient times, then we should be able to work out how big a boat could have sailed here thousands of years ago. Got some lovely bits of uh, pottery coming up now, Carl. Over in the Iron Age settlement, it looks like Phil's made the breakthrough he's been hoping for. The confusing strips of rock are beginning to reveal a recognisable shape, and there's at last some datable pottery from the trench. Oh, that's fantastic. This is the first distinctive Iron Age um, shirt I've seen on the site. I can tell that because it's very upright in nature, whereas the Roman ones are much more folded over. Probably sort of late third, early second century BC. So there's absolutely no doubt this could not be into the Roman period. No, this is definitely Iron Age from the upright nature of the rim. I mean, the thing that strikes me is that that shirt and the others with it are so big and in such good condition, they can only have come from this building. Absolutely. It would seem Phil's now confident enough to say that there is a building in his trench and it's roughly the same date as Francis's roundhouse. The trouble for me with a trench like this is all I can see are these great stripes of natural rock with this gritty stuff in between. And then down here, a great tumble of stuff. It's hard to imagine that anyone ever actually lived here. It just all looks so bleak until you come up with something like this which Phil just found, and it's so crisp. It, it could have been made 25, 50 years ago. But Phil, yep. this is actually Iron Age, isn't it? Oh, most certainly it is. I mean, we found it with all the Iron Age pottery. It, it's a spindle whirl. It's a natural stone with a perfect hole just drilled right the way through it. And they would have used it to, to, to spin their yarn. I mean, what you have is you have a, a stick coming through there and you, you attach the wall to the top and you literally drop it and at the same time you spin it. And this weight allows the momentum of the spindle world to keep going so you can tease out your yarn. Do you get the same sense of relief as I do that at last we've come up with something that belonged to a tangible human being who was living in the landscape? Well, that's right. I mean, it would have been a, presumably a woman who would have actually been making wool uh, or making the, the taking the wool to make yarn for garments. And, and although we haven't got the piece of stick, 
And although we haven't got the yarn, we haven't got the woolen garments, we know they existed simply because we got this. But as one archaeological door opens, another slams in your face. We've gained an extra roundhouse in Phil's trench, but Francis seems to have lost the settlement ditch he'd told me was right here. Uh, yes, well, that's what we thought this morning. Um, but I now think that it's the ditch that goes all the way round a house. But you said that ran round the whole Iron Age roundhouse, that ditch, this one, ran round the whole settlement. Yes, um, the, the problem has been that the ditch that went all the way around the house um, isn't there. So you weren't quite 100% right? No, I was 100% wrong. <laughs> so what is this? Well, look, here's your outer ditch for your house, yeah. OK? Then the wall would have been about here. Ah. And then here is the centre of the house. And right in the centre, look, we have a fantastically good hearth. That is gorgeous, isn't, isn't it? it? Yeah. Lined with stone and then with all this burning here. And it's uh, cut into a floor. And so this is, this is certainly the level where people actually walk. So that's very important. And um, it's in a sort of oval feature. That might just be the filling of a grave with a crouch burial in it. Because on Iron Age sites, sometimes they placed hearths on top of ancestral graves. That would be nice, wouldn't it? It would be lovely. We may have lost one of our targets, but it looks like we might have cracked what's going on in this top field. Or at least some of what's going on in this top field. Mick, we've got an Iron Age roundhouse in that trench there. Yep. We've got an Iron Age roundhouse in that trench there. Yeah. Are you happy to say that these are all likely to be Iron Age roundhouses? I, I think that's the reasonable conclusion for that. What we don't know, though, of course, is what these linear things are that run round the site. What do you think they might be? Well, I, I think they're probably field boundaries going with early fields. I mean, they're probably the ditch or the bank that goes with the field boundary, but we don't know what date they are. They could be earlier than the Iron Age, it could take us back into the Bronze Age, or indeed they could be later than the Iron Age. And I think tomorrow we've got to try and find that out. Henry's now reached two and a half metres below modern levels and deeper than the old charts show. The sand has turned to a grey silty mud that could be the surface of our ancient channel. This all looks very promising, so we're starting to try and work out what sort of ship could have made its way into this cove. We're also building up a more detailed profile of when and from where the more exotic finds on this site first arrived here. The pottery, in fact, is extremely helpful for dating what's going on in this trench. This pottery is from the 5th and the 6th centuries, and what's very interesting is that the pottery is coming from the Mediterranean, and some of it's coming from the Eastern Mediterranean. Anthea Harris is a Byzantine expert. That's the period after the Roman Empire crumbled to you and I. The theory that this little cove had a trading link with the Middle East is backed up by the finds made in Matt's Trench, such as the Roman coins and Turkish pottery. But I'm not clear what sort of building Matt's digging. Hang on, if this is the outside ditch, Where's the outside wall of the hut? The wall is actually there on top of that slaty natural. Then you've got the tumbled stone. But yesterday, we thought the outside wall was there. Yeah. So now, the house is about two-thirds the size it was yesterday. Well, it's more like half the size, actually. <laughs> so unfair. Yesterday, I'm going, oh, this is one of the most important yeah. post-Roman houses yeah. that there's ever been discovered. It's so big. But it's still important because it's still got the post-Roman pottery in the top layer. So it probably is a post-Roman building. Anything else wrong with it? It's not looking really quite as round as it was. It's more <laughs> rectangular or something. It's not looking quite as round no, as it was. That is archaeology well, speak, isn't perhaps it? Perhaps not round at all, but more... <laughs> I mean, it could be rectangular. But we can't be sure of that yet because we're still cleaning it up. So it does still make sense, even though it's much smaller than we thought, yeah, the, the hearth isn't where we thought it yeah. was, and it's rectangular, not round. It yeah. might be rectangular. But apart from that, nothing's changed. Well, I'm glad we've got that straight. So with just an hour or so to go on day two, we've made significant advances in both fields. But the picture's still elusive. 
At least some people have been having fun during our trip to the seaside. While we've been putting our trenches in up there, a couple of the team have been mucking about on the beach. While most people would just write, I love you or hello in the sand, Anthea and Stuart have created an entire map of Europe. Anthea, we've been talking about our pottery coming from places like Turkey and North Africa, but where exactly? Well, Tony, as you can see, I'm standing in North Africa and this piece of seaweed represents the city of Carthage. And this is the region from which we get African red slipware. But you're right, this is not the only place that we're getting pottery from, from this site. We're actually getting pottery also from the eastern part of the Mediterranean. We've got pottery coming out of southwest Turkey, in particular around about the Antioch region. And we've got pottery which comes from the Greek islands as well. And we think that what we may be seeing, therefore, is evidence of shipping coming directly from the east and possibly the city of Constantinople, going through the Mediterranean and up the Atlantic coast to Cornwall. But Stuart, look behind you. That's the mouth of the River Camel. Do we really think that 2,000 years ago, ships would have been able to sail through here and avoid all this sand in order to land by the side of our little site? It would. The evidence is increasing towards that effect. We've got the vessels coming up the Atlantic and coming into to the mouth of the estuary here. And we know those vessels are about 13, 15 foot deep in the water when they're laden. And the entry to the channel out there is about 20 foot deep. So it's increasingly likely that this whole bay could have functioned as a deep water port for those vessels. OK, he's convinced me. But we still have a lot of work to do to reveal the full story of this site. To start with, we don't know if the archaeology in the two fields we're digging is even part of the same village, or how long there was a settlement here. While we'll be looking for Bronze Age farmers in this field, over here we'll be continuing our hunt for the Dark Age traders. The house itself is proving pretty difficult to sort out, but hopefully we'll finish that tomorrow. In the meantime, look at this geophys, which is between where the house is and this curve where the harbour would have once been. What's going on here? Is this industry? Is it commerce? Is it an early Rickstein fish restaurant? We'll find out tomorrow. Day three here at our Cornish coastal site near Padstow and in prehistoric times we reckon there was a port all the way around here. We've certainly found Iron Age roundhouses up on the headland there and a mysterious structure from the time just after the Romans left Britain. But last night John produced this really amazing bit of geophys. A bit dramatic for the end of day two, isn't it, John? It's pretty good. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, these results are so different to the sort of roundhouse responses. Yeah. These yeah. look like small-scale industrial activity, sort of workshops, uh, maybe metalworking, boat building. If our port is down here, and our post-Roman building is here, and this is between, and that's a really interesting idea, because that could be post-Roman in date, and if it is, that, that would be exciting. If we're right, this is the prime location overlooking the ancient harbour. The sort of place where foreign traders would have come ashore, met the locals, and exchanged their wares for Cornish goods such as tin and copper. We've already uncovered some evidence of this trade in Matt's Trench, as well as a small and not terribly round house. We haven't, though, been able to work out how this building fitted into the port. But we've all got high hopes for Phil's new trench, albeit for different reasons. Mick believes this is just the right place for a trading post, whereas John Gia Fizz has put his money on something like a workshop. Either way, if we're lucky, we should get more information about where our ancient traders were from and when they visited. Ooh. Oh, look at that. Is that Sabian? Well, I think it is, except that it's so badly decayed. Look, all the, mm. the really bright red has worn off. But look, it's got this sort of spirally pattern going round there. And around there. It's very abraded. Well, it is, that is. But at least it's good Roman. But at this stage, it's impossible to tell if a good Roman was actually here. Over in the other field, 
we have a whole prehistoric village to deal with. And Francis is now looking for signs of the first settlers, possibly from the Bronze Age. Going down in. If Francis does uncover a prehistoric trackway, it could push the date of our site back by another thousand years. In the Iron Age roundhouses, we've had mixed results. Unfortunately, Tracy can't find any evidence of a burial under the hearth that Francis was talking about yesterday. So we're going to close this trench down. But in Phil's old roundhouse trench, Bridge is still coming up with the goods. I've got a small bit of slate that's come up and it's got a deliberate puncture through it. And I'm just thinking about whether it's part of roofing. Uh, no, at least I hope not, because you shouldn't have roof slates for at least a thousand years after the Iron Age. <laughs> OK, I've got two other options for you. Yeah. How about a weight for thatching yeah. or it's associated with fishing? It's a bit light for a thatch weight, mm. but I like the fishing suggestion because it has actually been sort of napped around the edges. Yes, it has been. So it's been deliberately reduced in size. But that's really nice because obviously people were using the sea there. They, mm. they would have been fishing and this is evidence of it. Mm. Yes, OK. Although we haven't any dating evidence to link these round houses with the port we're digging, the archaeologists believe they could have been occupied well into the Roman period. Francis, I've put roundhouses, or generic roundhouses, yeah. on top of where the geophysics showed these ring features, but it looks quite strange, really. I suspect these houses would have had um, a lot more by way of clutter around them. Uh, and a picture's emerging of a densely populated settlement overlooking the bay. But we still don't know if it had anything to do with the trading port. Oh, this shellman's beginning to come up the trumps. I mean... Down in Phil's harbour trench, the finds are coming thick and fast. Unfortunately, almost all of them are food waste, and that's not what John wants to hear. This is domestic rubbish, so they're living here. But it's not just domestic. I mean, surely this is slaggy sort of stuff or some sort of... No, this is actually burnt granite. Um, but even so, that's uh, certainly subjected the granite to a heat which is far more than the domestic situation to reduce it to this sort of grey ash. Are you picking up slag or are you picking up burnt granite on your geophysics? Well, to be honest, I, I can't differentiate between the two. I mean, they're going to give such similar responses. But the results we've got here suggest that there's more than just burnt granite. There's some industrial process going on. Can you think about what industrial purposes they might have needed uh, granite specifically for? They would have probably originally brought the granite to site for use as quernstones for perhaps grinding or crushing the ore. But, you know, after time, quernstones become useless for that function. So then they may have used it to build a um, furnace or something out of it because granite being an igneous rock would have been more resistant to heat initially. So we want a furnace, Phil. <laughs> but you've yeah. got, you haven't you got it on there? You get <laughs> digging, you find it. <laughs> Phil, look what Ooh, I've got. A bit of that one, I can't. Oh, well, that's fantastic. This is definitely... a native Roman ware, um, certainly late second, early third century. That, that's fantastic. We've definitely got the Roman now. It's still not a furnace, oh, though. No, Get no, on no, with it. Dating, that's what we want. Cracking, isn't it, eh? Over in Matt's trench, we still can't figure out what this not very round house is doing here. Looks like there could be two pieces, actually. Mm. They do. Now, that's the same 5th and 6th century stuff that we had from this trench before. This is really high-status stuff. I mean, it, it would have had wine or olive oil in it. But, I mean, you just don't find this sort of thing on most British sites. And, uh, I mean, to find one really fresh shirt, it hasn't been lying around for long. Mm. So that's got straight into the ground. And there's another one there's right another underneath one it. it. <laughs> I let's, mean, get, let's get that bit out as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're from the same pot. What's the betting I can get them to join? I'll get you a drink if you can sort it out. <laughs> Oh, there they there you go. go. Uh, you, a pint? <laughs> you owe me a pint, Matt. Yes, beautiful. I'm glad we've got an experienced archaeologist on this dig. This may be the least convincing pot reconstruction ever, but it's yet more evidence of trade. In this case, oil or wine coming along this coast in the 5th or 6th century. 
And if they brought a ship laden with cargo all the way from the heart of the Byzantine Empire, it would strongly indicate that the merchants knew their journey would be worth it. So we can only suppose they must have been exchanging their goods for the high-value tin and copper that Cornwall was famous for. But all our dating evidence shows this lucrative trade stopped suddenly in the 6th century. We've got a thousand years of trade, we've got farming, we've got some kind of industry, we've got boats pulling up at the harbour, and then suddenly, bosh, it all disappears. Why? What went wrong? During the course of the 6th century, it's fairly clear that the Byzantine Empire probably overstretched itself financially. It was trying to retake the West through a huge military campaign in Italy and elsewhere. And although that was successful temporarily, it overstretched the Byzantine Empire financially. At the same time, they were putting a lot of resources into defending their cities into f with fighting on their eastern frontier, as well as building palaces and churches. So just like the Romans in Rome 200 years previously, they overstretched themselves and had to retract and we were left high and dry. If you want to know more about trade between ancient Britain and the Middle East, visit our website. Back in the upper field, a jubilant Francis has found his target. I've no idea how he can tell from this rather manky trench, but I know he's going to show me. Well, in some respects, I think this is part of a key to the site. Um, that little depression where Ian's working is, in fact, a ditch. And there's another ditch here, and those two ditches mark the edge of a droveway. You say a droveway. What are they driving along it? Sheep and cattle, probably. Now, if you look at where this droveway is going to and from, at that end, over there, it starts just this side of those cottages. Yeah. OK? Now, all the way around this bay, you've got open grazing on the edges of the cliffs and the rocks. So you probably had thousands of sheep and cattle out there. And then they were taken in, probably in the autumn, along this droveway. And then beyond them, over there, you've got a large animal field or stock enclosure. Now, if you look at the edge of the settlement, it's going round like that and then like that in two distinct arcs. And I think that arc is defining the edge of that stockyard, making it a usable shape. And similarly, this is defining the edge of an arable field. And those two arable fields are precisely the same size, which is what you need if you're a farmer. What about the date? Uh, now, that's a tricky one. We know that this droveway is in a terrace that was ground down by animals' hooves over hundreds of years, probably. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if this droveway didn't begin in the Bronze Age, then go on into the Iron Age when it was formalised by the ditches. So, for all we know, there could be a thousand years of settlement on this hillside. Thank you, Francis. That's why this cluster of houses was such a peculiar shape. we simply haven't been able to find any material evidence that links roundhouses to the port complex next door. But with such a dense collection of sturdy large houses, I can't help but think this village must have benefited from the prosperity a successful port brings. It's a theory that would appear to fit in with Stuart's latest piece of work, because he believes our site was managed by a powerful tribe. You see the, the, the headland all the way around here. Uh, the village is in here. And if you look between these two curves, you see that line? Oh, you've got a bank and a ditch running across. And when you look in the field, you can actually see it. Is yeah. it to the right, going across the field? And across the track into the next yeah. field. That, there's a bank and ditch that cuts off that entire headland. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a classic promontory fort of the Iron Age where you control the, the headland and, and cut it off. And I think that's why the village here, it's kind of supporting that centre. And indeed, the, the linearity of that settlement and its direction we've puzzled about. And when you look at it, it's on this line here. And it points literally towards where you ought to cross into this tribal or chieftain centre upon the hill. I think its orientation is because it's geared towards that centre up there. Yeah. yeah, but I think it would be a mistake to think that the headland and, and, and the political centre up there um, actually had many people living on it. I think the people were actually living in our settlement over there, and because they're on the best agricultural land, whereas up there they'd have been wind blasted and exposed, and I think these people were supporting the headland. Mm -hmm. 
Throughout the day in Phil's harbour trench, we've been building up a picture of Roman traders. We found coins, samianware, slag and food waste. But we've been missing a crucial piece of evidence until now. These, Tony, are African red slipware sherds, which down here in Cornwall generally mean 5th and 6th century deposits. So that's post-Roman? Indeed, yes. And where were they found? Well, this is the important thing. Those shirts were found in there. In other words, they are well stratified. All the other shirts that we've had of that type of pottery have been in the colluvium, the hill wash, so they're totally unstratified. The, the stratification for them is good. Now that's digging speak for undisturbed archaeology. And it proves that these Byzantine finds in Phil's trench are contemporary with Matt's finds next door. Although we didn't find any proof to link our two fields, we now believe the whole site probably evolved over many hundreds of years from a Bronze Age farming community into one of the small but bustling late Iron Age trading centres scattered around the Cornish coast, meeting the demands for local commodities as the Roman Empire expanded. After the Romans disappeared in the 5th century, Merchants would have continued to call in occasionally with their exotic goods until the Byzantine Empire faded several hundred years later. It's lovely, isn't it? The perfect Cornish seaside picture with fields rolling down to the sea. It's hard to imagine just how busy it must have been in the ancient past with a thriving settlement trading with ships sailing in from the continent and beyond. And as they came in below that cliff just there, they would have brought with them fancy goods like oil and wine and new ideas too, perfectly symbolised by this find that's come up in the last hour or so. It's a stylus, possibly the earliest evidence of writing ever found in Cornwall, dating from around 200 AD. Maybe it was used to record all those imports. Actually, after three days, I could murder an amphora of wine myself. <laughs>